I remember the first time I saw a wood turning lathe being used, and I was just amazed at how quickly a rough piece of wood could be transformed into a beautiful finished piece. There was something very appealing about watching a bowl take shape and seeing the wood shaving shoot across the floor, unveiling a beautiful form on the lathe. Eventually I bought my own wood turning lathe, and it quickly became apparent that with so much wood being cut in such a short space of time, I'd have to sharpen the tools much more often than with other woodworking tools. I also realized that there were many different shapes and types of wood turning tools depending on the project being turned. When I started turning about 30 years ago, I found that sharpening my tools was an even greater challenge than making something on the lathe. My only option at the time was to sharpen my tools freehand on an aggressive old bench grinder, which ended up with the tools overheating and a poorly shaped cutting edge. And now as a wood turning teacher, the Tormek allows me to efficiently pass on my sharpening skills to students of all ages. All they need to sharpen their tools is a simple recipe for the jig settings and a little guidance on how to use the system, which really just takes a few minutes. This gives my students more time at the lathe with a perfectly shaped and sharpened tool. Hi, I'm Glenn Lucas, and I'd like to show you how you too can easily sharpen all of your turning tools using the Tormek T8 and the TNT808 wood turners kit. TNT just means touch and turn, so you can easily touch up the edge and then quickly get back to the lathe to turn. The kit also includes this handbook and the TTS100 profile guide. The handbook covers most types of turning tools, but it does focus on tools which are the most common and the most difficult to shape and sharpen, such as spindle gouges and bowl gouges, as well as rectangular and oval skew chisels with either a straight or a radius edge. The book is comprehensive, and it should be seen as a reference book rather than just a quick guide. I find the best way to get started is by using the TTS100 method for gouges and skews. And this selection chart contains tried and tested settings used by professionals all over the world. The first tool I'm going to sharpen today is a bowl gouge. And considering I've been a bowl turner pretty much all of my working life, I think that's a perfect place to get started. Now I get asked all the time, what is the best bevel angle to have on a bowl gouge? And you can ask 10 different turners, what's the best bevel angle? And you'll get 12 different answers. So let me put it this way. If I was stuck on a desert island, I could just bring a wood turning lathe with me and one tool with one bevel angle, then it would be a 16 millimeter bull gouge sharpened to 55 degrees. And the reason for this is that 55 degree bevel will allow me to rough shape a wet piece of wood or even a dry piece of wood and for that edge to stay sharp for quite a long time. And when you get to the inside of the bowl, that 55 degree bevel will allow you to start a cut at the top and work your way to the bottom and maintain bevel contact all the time. Now, it won't be perfect for every bowl that you make. So for example, if you're making a calabash bowl where the bowl closes in at the top, it's better to go to maybe 60 degrees or 65 degrees. If you're trying to make a really fine cut, on the inside or outside of the bowl, especially on the end grain surface, then a 40 or a 45 degree bevel will give you a finer finish, meaning that there's a little less sanding. So I'm gonna take you through the selection chart, we'll pick out two and we'll sharpen those tools. So the first tool we're gonna to look at sharpening is the 55 degree bowl gouge. It's got a jig setting of number four, P65 and hole A. So I'm gonna to have to set up the SVD186R jig. And you can see the way it's numbered here from zero up to number six. And then it's got an arrow here on the other side. But what I love about this is it clicks into place. So I don't actually look at the numbers anymore. I just listen. So I shut it down fully like that. So it's at 90 degrees. And then I just count. So one, two, three, 
before and then we just tighten up the thumb screw underneath and that's ready to go. I also have to make sure that that screw is left loose. This is used when sharpening V-shaped carving tools and of course being a wood turner I don't own too many of those so I leave that loose so it doesn't lock that into position. So next I'm going to set the protrusion to P65 and I think this is the setting that most people tend to get wrong. So it's important that first of all that you line the tool up parale parallel to these guidelines here and then firmly keep the tool down flat and then use your thumb to push it up securely there as well. Let's tighten that into place and then just give it another little tightening. The next thing we have to do is set up the distance of the universal support away from the wheel. So I'm going to use um, hole A and I really use hole A setting for every bowl gouge that I own and most spindle gouges ex except the spindle gouge set to maybe, set, maybe a, a 30 degree angle or so. So we just bring that out and the first thing I'm going to do is just rotate it. You see the way I've marked these two with black lines? So I've just taken this little marker here when this came new and just put that black marker across because that helps you see when it's turning. So let's rotate that. I can see the bottom one is turning. So I'm going to bring in this little thumb screw here for a second and just push it out a little bit more. Take another look from the side. Both of them are turning and then we lock these guys up. So that's set perfectly. Just before I sharpen this tool, I'd like to give you a couple of little tips. First is how I actually hold the tool. So I never grab the handle by the end when sharpening it. I'll put my thumb up here on top of the ferrule. And the reason for that is that I don't have to swing my arm as far to try and sharpen the tool. And if you do, you're less likely to get fluid motion. And also you have a little bit too much leverage and you can push harder than you should down on top of the wheel. The other thing is actually where to start from. So with 19 millimeter or 16 millimeter bow gouges, I start with the tool resting on the universal support and then I'll pivot over until it hits the same position on the other side. And I also keep these two fingers here pushing down all the time on the tool. So the tool can actually rotate underneath my fingers back and forth. It's also important that you don't stay in the same place on the wheel all the time because you'll end up with it dipping down or getting a little trough. And when it comes to leveling that wheel before sharpening a skew chisel or another straight edge tool, you're going to waste more material than you should. When it comes to sharpening smaller bowl gouges or spindle gouges, such as a 13 millimeter, I start with the tool not quite touching the support here at the bottom, but I start with it about the distance of my finger above the support. And the reason for that, if I turn it all the way down, the side wing will develop a little bit of a dip and that will render that side wing pretty much useless when I'm trying to make my shear cuts. When it comes to a 10 millimeter bowl or spindle gouge, I start with the tool pretty much level with the axis, rotating all the way over to the other side to the same position. So really just don't turn the tool as far when the tools become smaller in size. So let's get that started. So over here, starting here at the bottom, pushing down, quickly across the tip, and then more time on the other side. If you spend too much time on the tip, you tend to flatten it off because it's a smaller area in contact with the stone and it'll grind it away a little too quickly. So let's have a quick look at that. That's looking pretty good. We've got a good, clean, crisp bevel all the way around. And we have a second bevel there, you'll notice as well. The reason for that is when I'm working on the inside of a bowl, making a concave cut, it gives it a little clearance so you're not burying that heel into the curve of the bowl as you try to go around. So I grind that away. It's pretty simple how that's done. So all I need to do is loosen this thumb screw down here, slide it forward and focus on the heel. And that's it. It's interesting for me to watch some of the students sharpening their tools here in the classroom. 
Some students who are new to turning and new to sharpening are not quite sure when to stop. So if you spend a long time sharpening a tool, it doesn't make the tool any sharper, it just makes the tool a little shorter. And that's fine for somebody like me who's selling tools. They'll get through the tools a little bit faster, but if you want to hold on to those tools a little bit longer, the best thing is to just know what to look for. So the first thing is, just make sure that you have a clean, crisp bevel there all the way around, which I do. And the next thing is to just bring your finger in there or your thumb and just feel that you've raised the burr, which I have there the whole way around. So once I raise, raise the burr, I know I'm finished with the grindstone, but it's really important that you get rid of that burr because when you put that up to the bowl and you're trying to make a really fine cut, the edge is actually not meeting the wood. The burr is just hitting the wood first and it doesn't do the job that you would expect it. Now, if you're taking really heavy roughing cuts, those heavy cuts tend to knock that burr off pretty quickly. So I would always recommend that you use the profiled wheels or the leather wheels here on the other side when it comes to getting a really fine edge. It does pay off and you will notice a difference spending less time sanding. So let's get things set up for that. So I'll turn this around on the other side and again using hole A on the jig, bring that in and I don't have to be as precise because this has a little bit of flexibility in it. I've got the two wheels here now touching. And because this is a pretty new machine, it's important that I put some oil on the leather wheel. So let's just condition those now. So the oil that comes with this system will soften those leather wheels, making it much more effective when we put on the grinding paste. And then we have to hone the tools after that. Honing the tool is really very simple. I'm going to start by doing the bevel and then I'll finish by doing the flute. So I'm going to add a little bit of honing compound and there's a few different ways of doing this. Some people like to switch on the machine and apply it with the machine rotating. I just tend to do it with it stopped. I tend to save a little bit of the compound by doing that. So we'll start on this side. Just applying pressure, go to the other side, I'm going to put some paste back on the wheel, that's where I need it. It's looking pretty good. Let me just clean it off for a second, we'll take a closer look. Yeah starting to really polish up. So now I'm going to do the flute and I'll do that on the other side, the profile wheel. A little bit of paste. And here's where you need to be careful. If you spend too long or, or if you even present the tool in the wrong position, you can round over that edge if you're not careful. So I'm going to start with the handle down a little lower and then raise it until I bring the edge in contact with the profiled wheel. And then I need to make a side to side motion so that I eliminate the burr from the side wings. Let's just clean that off. A little bit more. Okay, I'll hold it up. Yeah, that's looking really good. So it's ready for action. Whenever I buy a brand new tool, there's a few things I need to consider. And probably the most important one is my marriage. 
So I have to make the tool look used as quickly as possible so my wife thinks I've had it all along. But the second thing you need to consider is that not only will the tool not be sharp, but it's unlikely to have the right cutting edge profile. And for that to happen, I need to remove lots of material before I can sharpen the tool. So I need to have a rough or a coarse surface on the wheel. And to do that, I'll use the stone grader. So it's got two sides. It's got the coarse side and then it's got the fine side. And I'll start off by holding the grater at a slight angle, so I'm working more from the corner, using firm pressure and then a side-to-side -side motion to grade the wheel. And that's going to take about 20 or 30 seconds. So let's do that. So at this point, the wheel is ready for reshaping the tool. And once I have the tool reshaped, then I'll pick up the stone grader and this time go to the fine side and just repeat what I did before. I'm going to sharpen the 13 mm bowl gouge and this is a wonderful tool when it comes to getting a great finish on either the inside or outside of the bowl. I sharpen it to 45 degrees which makes it ideal for push cuts and that's where I hold the handle right at the end and push the tool from the bottom all the way up to the top of the bowl. Now that's not an easy cut to make and somebody experienced in bowl turning can make it look deceptively easy. But that's where I'll come along and make a shear cut or pull cut, cutting with the side wing of the tool. This is a great cut because you can just focus on some of the ridges and take those away, which will quickly get you onto the sanding. On the inside of the bowl, 45 degrees also works really well on the end grain section, working really from the rim down about two thirds of the way. And at that point, I'll pick up another bowl gouge, sharpen to maybe 60 degrees, and that'll take me from that point all the way along to the center. To sharpen this tool, it's really very simple. I first need to change the jig setting from four to number two. So I just, again, listen to it click. So we lock that into position. I need to set the protrusion to P65. So I'm going to push down firmly, bring in the jig, lock that up tight. And I've already set the universal support to hole A. So the next thing I'm going to do, just to make sure that I have the bevel rubbing exactly right, just in case there's any little issues in the settings that I've used, I'm going to put some black marker here on the bevel. So I'm just putting marker really on the very tip. And the first thing I'm going to do before I switch on the machine is just rotate the wheel by hand. So I'm just listening for a smooth sound. And if that sounds coarse, it'll tell me something is wrong. So I'm going to just let you have a closer look at that. So you can see the black marker has been taken off from the heel all the way up to the cutting edge. So we are ready to go. So just before I switch on the machine, be careful not to turn this tool over too far. I'll put my finger underneath. That's a pretty good place to stop when sharpening a 13 millimeter bowl gouge. And then I stop in the same position on the other side. And I'm gonna spread the wear across the wheel. Do a little bit on the heel. reset it and all I need to do now is hone
sharpening my standard spindle gouge is the same as sharpening my 45 degree bevel bowl gouge. And in fact, I use the same settings for both my 10 millimeter and 13 millimeter gouges. 45 degrees is a very user friendly angle to start with on a spindle gouge. But some professional wood turners sharpen to 30 degrees, which is more versatile at getting into tight spots when turning fine detail. But there's a much steeper learning curve when learning to use this tool, with a high risk of the tool skating across your turn piece. When sharpening my spindle gouge to 30 degrees, I set the position of the universal support to hole B. I set the jig to the number 2 setting, and I set the protrusion to 55 millimeters. When sharpening, rotate the tool from side to side, beginning and ending parallel to the axis of the jig. And then you can finish off by honing the bevel and the flute, and it's all set for turning. These cutters are sharpened using the SVD186R jig. There are various types and sizes of exchangeable cutters for hollowing and scraping. The holes vary from 5 to 8 mm and can all be mounted on the shaft using the same screw. Cutters with 5 and 6 mm holes are centered on the first shoulder of the shaft and cutters with 8 mm holes are centered on the second shoulder of the shaft. Then lock the screw in place with the allen key provided. The cutters can be sharpened to their existing shape or to a new shape. When setting the edge angle use the Tormek edge marker when first sharpening. And then insert the shaft into the sleeve. Set the universal support so that the grindstone touches the entire width of the bevel by rotating the wheel by hand. When you've achieved the correct setting, then the black marker will be removed from the whole width of the bevel. If the cutter is not round, then the bevel angle will not be exactly the same all around, but this will have no effect on the turning. When sharpening the cutters, rotate the jig so you achieve an even grind all around the whole circumference. Slide the jig sideways on the universal support so the grindstone wears evenly using a light pressure for the best results. You can then remove the cutter to smooth the surface on the side of the grindstone. With the machine turned off, place the cutter against the wheel and then turn it on, moving the cutter from side to side to use the whole surface of the stone. It's important that you do not hone these small cutters on the lead or honing wheel as they can easily get caught and damage the surface. The SVD110 tool rest is perfect when it comes to sharpening scrapers of all shapes and sizes. Scrapers are used on face grain and end grain surfaces for the final finish, but never in my view on a spindle. They're likely to tear the surface, leading to a lot of sanding, getting rid of all the crisp detail. There's nothing quite like a sharp spindle gouge to give you a clean cut. However, scrapers work extremely well when you finish with a bowl gouge, and it'll quickly eliminate some of those ridges that you're likely to get, especially when you're new to turning. The more experience you get with a bowl gouge, then the less use you'll have for a scraper. But the important thing is that you keep it razor sharp and you sharpen it frequently. I often get asked, do I leave the burr in place or do I remove it after sharpening my scrapers? And there's a lot of different opinions about this. My personal preference is to leave the burr in place when using the scraper on side grains, such as a platter or a salad bowl. The burr gets pulled away quite quickly, so you do have to sharpen it quite frequently. On a square end scraper, I leave the burr in place, and this is perfect when quickly removing material to make a recess at the bottom of a platter. 
Whenever I'm working on end grain, such as the inside of an egg cup, then I'll always remove the burr. I like the tool to have a sharp edge, which will give a really clean finish. And the tool becomes less aggressive and less likely to catch when you take that burr away. Whenever you're setting up the SVD 110 tool rest for sharpening standard scrapers, you can use the angle master or the marker method. I find the angle master is a good option if you want to change the bevel angle on the tool. So for example, in this case, it's set to 70 degrees and I want to change it to 60. So I'll just bring it down to here, lock it up. And it's really easy to use. All I need to do is adjust the tool rest somewhere close to where I think it's going to be, apply a little bit of pressure to the thumb screw underneath, and then set the angle master up on top of the tool, bring it in, and just line it up with the top of the tool. And that looks good, so we'll just tighten it up fully, and then we're ready to sharpen the tool. In this case, I've sharpened this tool many times, so the marker method is going to work really well, so all I need to do is put a little marker on the very, very tip of the tool. And let's just change everything about for a second. I'll bring it a little closer and set it again with a little bit of tension. And I'm going to eyeball it here from the side. Let's lock it up. Let's just listen. Normally, if there's a very coarse sound, it's telling you it's way off. but in this case, I got it right straight away. So all I need to do is lock things up tight and I'm ready to sharpen. When it comes to holding the tool, I tend to hold it up close to the ferrule and just push firmly down on the tool rest. This is a French curved scraper, so it's got a big long bevel that stretches all the way around. So I'm gonna to have to swing the handle quite a bit. So I'll push down firmly, stand out of the way of where the handle is gonna move. And just bring it all the way around. Let's check. That looks good. All the marker is gone. I've got a clean, crisp bevel the whole way around. And I've got a burr on top. Now at this point, I have to decide, do I keep the burr or take it away? Well, I'm going to use this scraper inside an egg cup. That's end grain material, so it's best that I take the bar off. And to do that, it's quite simple. Let's remove the tool rest for a moment. We have to switch the universal support to the other side. Put the tool rest back in position. And I'm going to just line it up as close as possible to get the bevel rubbing. I don't have to be as precise when I'm using the leather wheel. Let's put on a little bit of paste. And all I need to do again is just push down firmly, stand out of the way of the long handle. And we'll polish up that bevel. So let's have a quick look at that. We have a nice polished bevel leading up to the edge, but the burr is still there. So let's get rid of the burr. So turning the tool upside down, I'm gonna start with the handle a little lower and just raise it up, move from side to side. And that's it. Got a nice polished surface there. Got a sharp edge, but no burr. So that tool should stay good and sharp for a long time. When it comes to sharpening a straight edge scraper, you'll notice sometimes that the rotating wheel wants to pick the tool up off the tool rest, simply because there's a lot of bevel contact between the wheel and the tool. So what I normally do is soften that lower edge, just grinding that heel away there reduces that effect. 
To do that, it's really very simple. I just hold the tool at an angle to the wheel, move it from side to side. Do the other side. And that will help you keep the tool firmly on the tool rest. Now take for example this French curve scraper. You'll notice that it has a second bevel, or the, I like to describe it as having the heel removed. And the reason that I do this is that it makes the sharpening of these tools with a longer bevel quicker on the Tormek. I go to the bench grinder and it's fitted with the BGM 100 and the adjustable tool rest and grind away quickly that extra material leaving only the minimal contact between the main bevel and the grinding wheel in future when I'm sharpening it. Negative rake scrapers have been around for quite a while and they've become very popular among wood turners in the past few years. I think the reason for this is they're really safe to use and they're very unlikely to catch. This makes them ideal for wood turners of all levels but especially new wood turners. My negative rake scraper has a bevel angle under 60 degrees, which makes it best to sharpen in the vertical position, which will have the grinding stone coming towards the tool, pushing it up against the tool rest. So when you're sharpening, start with the tool positioned upside down, matching the original bevel angle, and then finish with the tool the right way up. When it's sharpened correctly, you'll feel an obvious burr on the top surface. When I'm using the negative rake scraper, I position the handle underneath my arm and just raise it up a little bit. I apply just a little bit of pressure and focus really where there's ridges and then put the tool down and leave well enough alone. If you spend too long with the scraper, you'll end up spending a long time with the sandpaper. So just a gentle touch and walk away. The parting tool is used as the name suggests and that's to part one piece of wood from another. I use a thin parting tool when making a box so that I can match up the grain between the lid and the base. It's also really important when you're using this tool that you don't try and make the cut all in one, that you make several passes so that the tool doesn't bind in the cut. I use a parting tool also when I'm making an egg cup and I'm trying to separate it from the tenon held in the chuck. I'm going to sharpen this thin section parting tool which is only about 3 millimeters in thickness so the first thing I'm going to do here is bring the universal support in a little closer to the wheel and then adjust the TTS 100 tool rest so that it's pretty much in line with the center. I'm just going to eyeball it here. Let's bring it in a little closer but just make sure it's not actually touching the wheel. That would be a problem. So we'll lock these screws into place and it's important that this is still movable so only a little bit of pressure here so I can still adjust it and it just stays put for the moment. So using a ruler I'm going to bring it past the center of the wheel and I'm going to bring it down until it's about one and a half millimeters from the center point which is half the thickness of the parting tool I'm going to sharpen. So that's about two, a little bit more, that looks good. We'll lock it up there firmly and then we are pretty much ready to go. So when sharpening this, it's important that I keep firm pressure down on the tool rest because the wheel has a tendency to want to lift it up as it's rotating upwards. So I'm going to just bring it down, bring the heel into the wheel and then pivot until I bring the full surface of the bevel in contact with the wheel. Do that side, flip it over and then do the other. have a quick look. So what I'm looking for here is one clean crisp bevel the whole way across and I think we've achieved that at this stage that's looking pretty good. So now we're ready to do the other side. So we bring it down, heel, then bring in the toe, the edge is the toe, slide it from side to side and again 
I'm looking for a clean, crisp bevel. Let's have a look at that. Yeah, that's really, really good. So the next step here is to hone the bar off both sides of that tool and then hone the bevels each side as well. So I need to apply a little bit of paste to the wheel. And we'll polish each side now. So handle down to start with and then just lift until I make contact. Just be careful that you don't lift the handle too high. You don't want to bury the sharp point into your leather wheel. Okay, let's check that. So the burr has gone from this side. Let's take off some of that base, put it back onto the wheel again. And then again, handle down, pivot in, make a side to side movement. That feels good. Okay, so let's do the two bevels. So heel and then lift the handle. Go again. Then turn it over. And where's my cloth? Let's just clean that up and see what it looks like. So that looks good. And we're starting to get rid of some of those grinding marks from the both sides. They will disappear eventually um, when you get into the habit of uh, polishing using the leather wheel each time you sharpen. And that's ready for action. When sharpening flat parting tools wider than 6mm or diamond section parting tools, they should be sharpened using the multi-jig with the open seat. Once the parting tool is locked securely, then you can sharpen both sides of the tool without removing it from the jig. That'll make it easy to keep the cutting edge lined up precisely with the centre of the tool. I first set the protrusion to 65mm and then you can set the bevel angle correctly by using the marker method. When the tool is sharp, then you can finish freehand on the leather honing wheel for a longer edge life and better cuts. A spindle roughing gouge is an important part of a spindle turner's toolkit. It's used to take a four-sided piece of wood or an irregular branch section of long grain and turn it into a cylinder before using other tools to refine the shape. This tool is never used on face grain work such as bowls or platters for both practical and safety reasons. It's normally sharpened with a short bevel angle between about 45 and 50 degrees which helps maintain a sharp edge while cutting these irregular pieces. The cutting edge on this tool has to withstand a lot of abuse from either the corners coming around or an uneven surface. When I'm sharpening the spindle roughing gouge, I'm going to use the multi-jig fitted with the open seat. I'm going to set the protrusion to P75 millimeters. And then use the marker method for setting up the universal support. Just really there on the tip. So I need to slide the universal support in or out until I have full bevel contact. Let's just try it there for a second. And just rotate the wheel by hand. And that sounds pretty smooth, so I think I'm close. Let's have a look at that. And that looks really good. So we're ready to sharpen this. I'm going to give you a couple of tips just before I switch on the machine. So hold the jig firmly and be careful with the starting position when you're sharpening this tool. Some people have a tendency to turn that right over so that the flute is at 90 degrees to the universal support. All that will do is take away this corner, which I find quite valuable when it comes to rough shaping certain spindle shapes. So I'm gonna rotate over until I just make contact between the corner here and the wheel. Don't turn it any further than that. And the same on the other side. 
So side to side movement for the right hand wing. Roll around the tip and then stop just in time on the other side as this point makes contact with the wheel. Let's just check that out. And that looks really good. I've got a clean, crisp bevel the whole way around. The black marker is gone. And when I put my finger in on the flute, I can feel I've raised the bar. And that's telling me I've removed enough of the material so that I now have a tool that's sharp and ready to be honed. To hone the bevel, I just need to remove the universal support and put it the other way around. I'll bring it in a little closer and just get the bevel in contact with the wheel. A little more. And that looks pretty good. I'll just lock it up into place. Now a little honing compound. And off we go. So grip the jig quite firmly and just rotate all the way around. Again, not turning the tool too far that you're going to stick the corners into the leather wheel. Let's just clean that off. That's looking pretty good. All I need to do now is hone the flute. So a little more honing compound. And I'm gonna start with the handle low and then just raise it up and making a side to side movement, getting rid of the bar all the way around. And that's ready to knock the corners off a spindle. The multi-jig can be used for sharpening various different types of skew chisels. But the first thing I need to do is remove this V-block. And this is referred to in the handbook as the open seat. So we take that out. Take off the clamping screw and next install the closed seat. So the closed seat is calibrated here on the side and that allows me to set the various skew angles that I wish to work with. It's also got a V-shaped clamp and this will allow it to self-center the skew chisel whether it's oval or rectangular in section. The only thing to watch out for with skew chisels that have a square edge is that they're likely to bite into the jig and make it more difficult to center it. And also you'll have issues when you're using that tool on the lathe. It tends to score the tool rest, making it difficult to slide the tool along. So I find the best thing to do when you buy a brand new tool is take those corners off. And I just place it up to the grinding wheel at 45 degrees to soften those corners. This will make life a lot easier in future. To ensure accurate results when you're using the multi-jig, it's important to first check that the universal support is parallel to the grinding wheel. So bring the universal support in nice and close. And in this case, I can see that it's parallel. If it's not, all I need to do is use the diamond truing tool before I start sharpening the tool. And that'll mean that I'll get equal results on the bevels each side. 
Many professional woodturners, that includes myself, prefer to work with a radius edge skew chisel. I find it really versatile at the lathe. I can use it for rolling beads, I can use it for peeling cuts, reducing quickly the size of a tenon, or I can use it for making a regular skew cut. But it's also much faster sharpening on the Tormek because you have less bevel contact with the wheel when sharpening at any one time. I'm going to sharpen my radius edge skew chisel, but first let's take a quick look at the selection chart. So this is how I sharpen my tool. These are the settings I use. So jig setting 30 degrees, protrusion of 65 millimeters, and then hole B. And that gives me a 45 degree bevel angle. And I've put all that information here on the label so that I don't have to look at the chart in future. So first thing I'm going to do is set up the distance of the universal support to hole B. Just slide that in. Get the two wheels in contact. And let's just try rotating. So the top one is touching, but not the bottom one. Let's go a little closer. That looks good. Next, I'm going to set the jig to 30 degrees. And I need to line up the lines here on both sides. That's look pretty good. Actually, what I'll do is tighten it a little bit and then precisely line that up. So we'll tighten that into place. And then set the protrusion to P65 millimeters. When I'm sharpening this, I just have to be careful as I pivot the tool. So I'm going to pivot on this point here starting on the short point of the skew chisel and then pivoting until the long point makes contact. If I go further, then I can obviously slide off the rest and damage the tool. So I just have to watch out for that. And when I'm happy with this side, I'll turn the tool over and do the same on the other. Let's have a look at that. That's really, really good. Perfect. So now the other side. Again, starting on the short point. Pivot to the long. And keeping pressure all the time on this pivot point over here. look. That's the other side done. All we have to do now is hone the bevel. So taking off the universal support, switch it the other way around. Again, setting using hole B. Let's just try that. That looks good. A little bit of honing compound. will polish those bevels. So the same action as before, pushing firmly against the rest, and firm pressure against the wheel with my fingers. Let's stop there and have a look. So I'll take off some of that paste, put it back on the wheel again, and do the other side. I think that should do it. It looks good and sharp. Whenever I'm sharpening a straight edge skew chisel, I set the multi jig to 20 degrees. When I'm sharpening it, I just push it firmly against the wheel, drop the handle, come over, reposition, and don't slide from side to side.
Now that my tools are sharp, it allows me to focus on the important things in my workshop, such as bold production and working with my students. You too can easily get professional sharpening results with just a little guidance and some practice. I find the most important thing to get right when sharpening is to pay careful attention to the jig settings, especially things like the protrusions when using the TTS 100. When you get these little things right each time, sharpening really only takes seconds with most tools. The Tormek marker method is a really good way of getting consistent results. It saves steel and it saves the wheel. So thank you for watching and remember, stay sharp.